We're in January in Melbourne and things go exactly as we'd expect them to. It's a hot summer, there's some music, some good ambience, some party. The French players get eliminated pretty fast from the Australian Open. But there's one thing which is different this year. What is it? The water reservoirs are actually all full. To understand why that's so surprising, we need to rewind a bit. Melbourne wouldn't be this vibrant Australian city on the southeastern coast of the continent, nestled by the shores of Port Phillip Bay, if it wasn't for Batman. I'm Batman. No, not that Batman, but a chap called John Batman, an explorer from Tasmania that landed at the Yarra Bay's natural harbour, traveling from Hobart and declaring, I'm told, I wasn't there, this will be the place for a village. True story. Melbourne's story took a fast twist two decades later when the Victorian gold rush turned that said little village into a booming city. People from all around the world were hopping on ships, dreaming of striking it rich. That's how by the late 19th century, Melbourne became one of the largest and wealthiest city in the world thanks to all that gold. That's also where it got its character that still exists today with grand boulevards, lush parks and a vibe that says we've made it. But as it crossed the 100,000 population mark around 1858, Melbourne became thirsty. Melbourne was built on the banks of the Yarra River for a reason. That's where the first inhabitants were getting their drinking water from. But for long, that's not sufficient anymore. We've already covered that in New York and Singapore, so I won't paint it in too much details. But you can imagine that 100,000 people drinking the water from the Yarra's creeks, where they also peed and pooed, led to serious sanitary issues. So the city leaders resolved to catch rainwater, store it and keep it clean for everyone, which resulted in a first big move, for which I have a fun fact for you. When it got built in 1857, the Yan Yin water reservoir was the largest largest artificial water reservoir in the world. If that fact doesn't impress your grumpy uncle at the next family gathering, I don't know what will. Anyways, located about 30 kilometers north of the city, the Yan Yan was Melbourne's first major reservoir, tapping into the Plenty River. At the time, it also was a marvel of engineering, showing that Melbourne was serious about sorting out its water issues. Hence, the city didn't stop there. The late 19th century saw a flurry of reservoir building, strategically placed, and tapping into various rivers and catchment areas to diversify sources, and increase reliability. Over the course of a bit more than a century, Melbourne has built 10 water reservoirs. But to fill some of them, they're actually kind of cheating. To understand the origins of the cheat, we actually have to fast forward from the late 19th century to the early 21st one. That's when the millennium drought hit. That severe period of dry conditions that gripped Australia began around the year 2000 and stretched on for over a decade, finally easing around 2010. For nearly 12 years, rainfall levels were way below average, rivers and lakes shriveled up and soil moisture was at an all-time low. The landscape which you see around me today being vibrant and lush turned into a parched and dusty canva. For Melbourne, a city conscious of its water needs since almost its inception, the millennium drought was a harsh blow. Water reservoirs, the city's main water sources, saw their levels plummet dangerously low. The city faced strict water restrictions, lawns went brown, car washing became a luxury, and even flushing toilets with drinking water was frowned upon. The drought officially ended around 2010, when significant rainfalls finally returned, replenishing water sources. But the impact of the millennium drought lingered. It was a wake-up call, highlighting the vulnerability of Melbourne's water supply. Melbourne had felt weak, and it didn't like the feeling, so it decided it was time to act. By 2007, so almost 8 years into the drought, it kicked off a desalination project in Wontagi and issued a tender to design, build, finance, operate and maintain it, which got awarded to a special consortium named Aquasure in June 2009. A plant that size isn't the kind you build in a snap, so when in 2010 the drought finally ended, the desalination facility was just about to start building. In 2011, as a young water professional, I was sent to Melbourne to visit and report on the Victorian desalination plant, which was currently built. And the least I can say is that the, that plant has an amazing story. Let me recap that. The plant was the first of that scale to be built under a private-public partnership in Australia. The Aquashore Consortium, consisting of Tees, 
Macquarie Capital and Suez Environment committed to build the desalination plant, but also two 4 meter wide and 1.5 km long ocean pipes for intake and outtake, an 85 km long 1.9 meter wide pipe to connect the plant to the Cardinia Reservoir, and a 60 km high voltage underground power connection. They would finance all of that by raising some debt on the finance market and would repay their efforts with an operating and maintenance contract running until 2039, after which the plant would be transferred back to the government of Victoria. Well, so far so good. At that stage, everybody was super happy. Melbourne would have to wait 28 months, but it would get up to 150 billion liters of water per year, which would cover a third of its needs. Thys and De Grémont would build the plants together in a 65-35 person deal and then operate together as well, this time in a 40-60 person deal. And Macquarie was making sure finances would keep afloat. Suez Environment printed all over its 2010 annual report how the project was a source of growth and international expansion, with De Grémont bringing in a nearly 40% increase in revenue that year alone. But things were about to take a funny turn. Remember how the Millennium Drought ended in 2010? Well, what brings the drought to an end? Exactly. Rain. The last quarter of 2010 and the entire 2011 were actually super rainy, about twice the before drought average. If you've ever done civil works, even on a garden shed, you know that rainy and muddy conditions are everything but ideal. And indeed, that was the problem's starting point. Works got slowed down, working conditions got difficult, unions protested, and by Suez's 2011 yearly report, the tone had changed. Now it was about writing off 262 million euros of losses, anticipating project delays and initiating claims between the building consortium Thys de Grémont, the Aquasure Larger Consortium and the Victorian government. In 2011, Suez wrote off another 60 million loss and again a similar amount in 2012, which was partially compensated by the refinancing of the project's debt. Finally, in December 2012, the plant was completed with a one-year delay, releasing the construction team's financial liability. Now it was time for them to start operating, repaying their investments and turning a profit. I smell a rat. In 2012, it finally got commissioned, but it didn't produce a single drop of water before 2017. Don't laugh, that's true. Although the plant was now fully functional and ready to produce, two years of largely above average rainfalls had well replenished Melbourne's water reservoirs. By December 2012, they were about 80% full. And when the water that falls from the sky for free fills your reserves, you don't need the most expensive of all your water sources to deliver anything. And so from 2012 to 2017, a brand new and fully functional desalination plant was put on hold to wait for drier times. Now, that series of mishaps for the private parties that had invested in Melbourne's water security is also to be nuanced. Indeed, even if it regularly produces water since 2017, the Victorian desalination plant still does it in a very different fashion compared to other plants in the world. Many desalination facilities around the world work on demand. After all, it makes about sense that you'd only use your most expensive water source when you have no other choice. And as the nature and process of reverse osmosis plants make them relatively easy to start and stop, it's a convenient way to go at it. So you see, on the principle, nothing outrageous, that's also what Melbourne does. The plant is not run continuously, but on demand. Yet, what's very special about it is the periodicity of this demand. Every year on the 1st of April, no joke, Melbourne orders water to be produced the next year. Yep, exactly. If you're the mayor of Melbourne, you have every year to look into your crystal ball, probably also the level sensors of your water reservoirs, and take a bet. Tricky, right? Well, wait, there's more. Let's take an example to illustrate it. In March 2023, Melbourne's reservoirs were over 91% full, so the city mayor announced he would not order any water, which means that for the entire 2024, the Victorian desalination plant will stay shut down. Once more, it makes sense, as the reservoirs are full. And even though the plant has a 150 billion liters per year capacity, it has never been ordered to deliver that much. It produced 50 gigaliters in 2017, 
15 the two next years, 125 in 2020, 21 and 22. So almost its full capacity over these three years. But then again, only 15 in 2023 and now zero for 2024, which again already was its input for 2012 to 2016. But even if Melbourne doesn't order any water, that doesn't mean the city won't need to pay for it. The contract also accounts for standby costs, which cover the ongoing maintenance and financing of the plant, ensuring it remains ready to produce water when needed. This translates into a fee of 1.8 million Australian dollars per day, which is payable to the construction consortium until 2039, regardless of whether water is required or not. As a result, the Victorian desalination plant will cost the city 660 million Australian dollars in 2024, even though it won't produce a single liter of water. So what does the future of water hold for Melbourne? More desalination? More clever approaches? Well, probably a mix of both. Another factor that explains the relative uselessness of the desalination plant is that Melbourne has done huge efforts to increase its water reuse capability, something I'll cover in a separate video. Make sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss out. You'll get to know why pink is a super cool color. That leads to the production of manufactured water, which in turn is used in industrial and agricultural applications and has welcome environmental effects. One thing's for sure, one of the objectives of this additional manufactured water is to bring more water to the environment to let more water in the river and ultimately to treat water more sustainably. Something that's very important in a region that has a history of struggling to do so. Remember my deep dive on the neighboring Murray Darling River Basin? Well, in March of 2023, it experienced once again an episode of fish kill in Menindee. So yes, Melbourne has been lucky enough to not need its desalination plant as much as planned since the millennial drought, except for the 2020, 21, 22 period. But still, climate change being here to stay. Thank you, Captain Obvious. There's a solid chance the city will sooner or later be quite happy to have its 150 gigaliter capacity at disposition. In their Greater Melbourne Urban Water and System Strategy Water for Life report in 2022, the local water utilities estimate that by 2070, Melbourne will need an extra 600 gigaliters of capacity flowing from desalination, fit for purpose reuse, and integrated water management. So if I had to bet, I'd expect the Victorian desalination plants to run at a higher average over the decades to come. That's it for today, but that's absolutely not it for my exploration of water in Australia. So check here if you want to understand why pink is the new blue and subscribe so that you don't miss the next releases and I'll see you next time.